In this video, we're going to start looking at uh, chapter 15 and 16 together. So 15 is over ionic bonding, uh, 16 is over covalent. We're also going to be looking at metallic bonding um, during this. So as we go through these chapters, what you really want to focus on is uh, kind of what is each type of bond, uh, how is it occurring, and how is that giving us uh, the properties for these compounds that we've come to know. Okay, so as we start here, we're going to be talking uh, kind of the relationship between electron configuration and how this ionic bonding takes place. So first thing that we need to recognize is that all elements that are in a specific group have the same number of valence electrons. So all the elements within any family, any group, have the same number of valence electrons. And just to remind you, we talked a little bit about this back in chapter 13, I believe, that... Uh, valence electrons are the electrons in the highest energy level that that um, atom has. And we can find that from an atom's electron configuration, like we saw how to find last chapter. And it really comes down to the fact that the number of valence electrons that an atom has plays an incredibly large role in the chemical properties of that element, which explains why elements in the same family or the same group have similar chemical properties because they all have the same number of valence electrons. Uh, now, we can easily find the number of valence electrons that an atom has uh, simply by looking at their group number. So if you look at a periodic table, uh, we can see starting at the far left, we have group 1A, then 2A, then we skip the transition metals, then group 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, 8A. Um, any group that ends in A the number of the group tells you the number of valence electrons. So all the elements in group 1A have one valence electron. All the elements in group 7A, like the halogens, have seven valence electrons. And it's the valence electrons, because they're on the outer portion of the atom, are the generally the electrons used in the formation of chemical bonds. And so that's why we're concerned with them in terms of chemical properties, because again, these are the ones that are gonna be bonding. Uh, and that should make sense. Think about um, an object like an apple or an onion or something like that. Uh, if you hold on to it, if you interact with it, you interact with the outer portion of it. It's the exact same thing with the valence electrons. Now, we're going to learn how to write something called an electron dot diagram. Very, very easy to do. Um, and when we do an electron dot diagram, we represent the valence electrons in there. So when we talk electron dots, uh, it's the valence electrons that we are dealing with. So here is a uh, kind of brief periodic table. Again, incomplete. We're only going down through period four. We're skipping the transition metals showing electron dot diagrams for uh, various representative elements. Notice with this that uh, all the elements in the same family or the same group have the same number of valence electrons. So we can see uh, like here in, let's say, group 3A, all the elements here in group 3A have three valence electrons. And that's what we'd expect from earlier. Now the chemical symbol part of the electron dot diagram uh, represents everything in that atom besides the valence electrons. So that symbol is the nucleus, it's all the inner electrons, and then we use the dots to represent the valence electrons. Now a couple general rules that we want to follow when we're looking at electron dot diagrams. Uh, for the most part, we want to put one electron on each side of the atom before we start doubling them up. So, but it doesn't really matter where they go before then. So for instance, with lithium here, I put the dot on the right. I could have just as easily put the dot on the left. I could have put it at the top. I could have put it at the bottom, but not all at the same time, obviously, because lithium only has one valence electron. So if we look at something like uh, boron here, boron's in group 3A, so it has three valence electrons. Uh, I chose to put one on the left, one on the right, one on the top. That is completely arbitrary. I could just have easily, when doing boron, so there's my element done uh, like this. 
that would be just as valid, just as correct. What we generally don't see, however, is where we have the element and then we start doubling up right at the start. So one, two, three. Uh, we generally don't see that. You may, now you may notice that over here with helium. Helium's kind of an exception. And if you think about it, um, helium being uh, having only the, the electron configuration of 1s2, um, its out, outermost uh, electron shell or uh, energy level is full. The one first energy level is full with the two electrons. So it's kind of common to group them together because they're all in the one, that 1s sublevel. Uh, but helium is really the only exception to the don't double things up. Okay, so now we're going to start looking at uh, the electron configurations and what this means in terms of ions. Now we know that the noble gases are inert. That means they don't react. Because they don't react, they became kind of our baseline of understanding of what's going on. Now in 1916, I believe it was a chemist, though he could have been a physicist or a mathematician, it all kind of blends together at that point, uh, came up with a reason why atoms form different kinds of ions and molecules. Now you may remember that earlier in the year, I showed you a pattern on the periodic table. I said all the alkali metals form a plus one ion. All the uh, alkaline earth metals form a plus two. I said we'll talk about the reason for that later. Well, the future is here. And so we're going to be able to use uh, Lewis's idea to explain why these um, cation, these metals form these specific cations. And the reason behind this was an idea called the octet rule. And what the octet rule says is that atoms in compounds tend to have the electron configuration of a noble gas. So again, we're basing everything on the noble gas. We're basing this on the idea that the noble gases are stable and things react to become stable. They react to become like the noble gases. And when we talk react, that means goes from its elemental state to its ionic state. Um, and again, remember that each noble gas, with the exception of helium, has all have eight valence electrons, or eight electrons in the highest energy level, so something S2, something P6, it's so like 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, 3P6, so on and so forth which is what leads us to the term octet. So general rule, and we've seen this before, uh, atoms of metals obey the octet rule by losing electrons. We'll kind of talk about why that is in a moment. Atoms of non-metals obey the octet rule by gaining or sharing electrons. Now only non-metals can share, and it's that sharing that actually gives us the covalent bond that we're going to talk about uh, in the next chapter. Now how does this work? So again, metals lose electrons. We know this. We know metals form cations. So let's take a look at sodium here. This is the electron configuration of sodium. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. Now according to Lewis, sodium wants to get the electron configuration of a noble gas. Well, it currently has one valence electron in its highest energy level. So it wants to follow the octet rule. It's generally going to want to have eight. So it has two options. It can either lose one electron or gain seven. So if it loses one electron, uh, sodium ends up being like neon. If it uh, gains seven, then it can be like argon. Both of those are noble gases. Well, nature's lazy. It's going to do what's ever easiest. It's easier to lose one electron than it is to gain seven. So in forming a compound, sodium is going to lose that one electron to make a sodium ion. And again, by losing an electron, because electrons have a negative charge, it picks up a plus one charge. So sodium ion has this electron configuration, which is the same electron configuration as neon. So it's following the octet rule. Now there are a few exceptions to this, and I want to be very clear, you are do not need to know the specifics of the exceptions. Now when I talk exceptions, especially when I'm talking metals, what sort of metals come to mind? That's right, the transition metals. Uh, so not all metals will actually get the noble gas configuration, and there are exceptions to the octet rule. Uh, and really these are the transition metals. So here's an example of silver. 
So this is Silver's actual electron configuration. Now you may remember that way, way back, we mentioned that the transition metals have weird electron configurations. Um, and that's true. So you may notice that this 5s should actually be 5s2 and then that 49. But again, odd electron configuration because it's a transition metal. So to achieve the noble gas configuration for krypton, it would have to lose 11 electrons or gain 7 to be like xenon, neither of which is going to happen. Um, it is really rare to gain or lose more than 3. Not impossible, but very rare. And the more than 3 it becomes, the rarer it is. So gaining or losing 7 or 11 is incredible. So instead, what silver does is it loses that 5s1 electron then it has a full kind of outer configuration um, it, basically all of its subshells are full and that's really what we deal with um, and so it's called a pseudo noble gas configuration pseudo um, kind of meaning false so it's not a true uh, noble gas configuration it's kind of a false one where it does have full sublevels, um, but in this case, it's actually missing uh, its uh, 5s and it has that 4d uh, sublevel that's filled up, which is not normal for the trans uh, for the noble gases. Uh, and here I've listed some other ones. Uh, there's many more than that. This is really what the transition metals do. Anions are handled pretty much the same way. So again, nonmetals form anions. So that means they're going to gain electrons. Well, why do they gain electrons? Again, to be like the noble gases. So let's take a uh, look at chlorine. Chlorine is in group 7A. It's a halogen, so it has seven valence electrons. Here is chlorine's electron configuration. So we see it has seven valence electrons in the 3S and the 3P. So that means to be like a noble gas, it can either gain one or lose seven. And like sodium, it's choosing to do whatever is easiest. It's going to gain one. So it gains one. It gets this electron configuration through, uh, where it ends with 3s2, 3p6. Uh, so chlorine is now just like argon, same exact electron configuration. So it's meeting the octet rule. Uh, and again, pretty much you're aiming for eight valence electrons with the exception of the really light elements, hydrogen, lithium, beryllium, and boron. Uh, they will all lose electrons uh, to be like helium, uh, which only has two. Okay, so we're now looking at section 15.2 and looking at kind of what's causing and going on with ionic bonds. Now, just to remind you, uh, for this overall unit, this kind of 15 and 16 together, we want to focus on uh, kind of what is each type of bond uh, and how it's forming and what it forms between. So, when we're talking ionic bonds, uh, it all goes down to anions and cations. Now we know anions have a negative charge. We know cations have a positive charge. We learned that way back early in the year. And be because one's positive, one's negative, they're going to attract each other. Opposites attract. Uh, truer words have never been sung in a song with a cartoon cat. Um, we call that force of attraction between the cations and the anions the ionic bond. One of the things I want to stress here is that the ionic bond is not a physical thing. Uh, it's not like rope holding these two ions together. It's more like what you would see with uh, the north end and the south end of a magnet attracting each other. Uh, that's kind of what this ionic bond is. It's just that force of attraction between the positive and the negative. Uh, in the end, and we learned this earlier in the year, ionic compounds will always be neutral. So how do we get to be neutral when they're made up of ions? Well, it's because you have equal amounts of each charge. Equal If you have five positive charges and five negative charges, the overall thing is neutral. Now, as a note, um, ionic compounds are also called salts. Salt is a generic word that chemists use for ionic compounds. Uh, so you can always be cautious if you go over to a chemist's house and uh, you're, you're eating dinner that they serve and you think, oh, I need more salt on this. And you ask them for salt, uh, be specific in the salt that you want. Ask for sodium chloride, um, because otherwise they could give you um, arsenic something or sodium cyanide, and then you die. And they're like, ah, you asked for it.
because you asked for salt without being specific. Um, okay, I'm not sure that would actually happen, but just, just always be cautious about that. And we talked about this here, that the positive charge of the cation must equal the negative charge on the anion. In other words, this is how you end up with a neutral compound. You have equal amounts of positive and negative charge. Now, how does this process work? So again, we want to focus not only on what is each type of bond, what it's between, but also kind of the mechanism of it. So uh, we're going to use sodium chloride as an example. Uh, we know sodium has one valence electron because it's in group 1A. And to meet the octet rule, which we learned about previously, uh, it's going to want to lose that one electron so that we'll have a full uh, octet. Um, so yeah, chlorine has seven valence electrons being group 7A, so to, for it to most easily fulfill the octet rule, it wants to gain one. So what happens is sodium loses the electron to become stable. Chlorine takes that electron from the sodium, both becoming stable. So what you now have is you have a sodium ion and a chloride ion. So we had atoms. The sodium gave uh, the, its electron to chlorine or chlorine took it, however you want to uh, perceive it. And we now have these positive and negative ions. And because they are now a positive and negative ion, they now attract each other and they stick together. That attraction is the ionic bond. So again, it's kind of a two-step process. It's this transfer and then attraction. And that attraction is what we call the ionic bond. Uh, it has a formula unit of NaCl because to be neutral, we need one sodium and one chlorine. Sodium has a plus one, chloride has a uh, minus one. So that's, that's that. Uh, so kind of view a version of this or a drawing of this. So what we can see here is Here's sodium's valence electron. It's going to go over to the chlorine. So chlorine now has a full octet. We have our sodium now with a positive charge. We have our chlorine with a full octet with a negative charge. And then they attract each other. And because they're attracting each other, that is the ionic bond. So let's look at another example of this. So let's play with aluminum bromide. And you see I provided us with lots of aluminums, lots of bromides kind of play with here. So each aluminum has three valence electrons. I know that because it's in group 3A. Uh, bromine has seven valence electrons. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So what we're now going to do is the aluminum is going to give a valence electron to the bromine. Now, when that happens, that bromine now is fulfilling the octet rule. It's not going to take any more electrons, but the aluminum still is not meeting the octet rule. So the aluminum has electrons to give. The top bromine is full, so we need a second bromine. So we get a transfer to there and a transfer to there. So when everything is said and done, what ends up happening is for this aluminum bromide, uh, the aluminum has to bond with three separate bromides, which gives us the formula AlBr3. Um, did I need these aluminums here at the bottom? No, we did not. They are just there just in case we needed them. We didn't. Uh, so that is all fine and dandy. So what are these properties of these ionic compounds? Uh, most ionic compounds form crystalline solids at room temperature. So we get these regularly repeating patterns of these ions, and we've seen that with our models before. Uh, when you dissolve these in water, they will conduct electricity, and that's because electricity at its heart is this uh, kind of uniform motion of charged particles. Well, cations and anions are charged particles. And uh, so when we dissolve, in, um, dissolve them in water, they separate. We'll talk more about that as the year progresses. And they're free to move around. So because they are free to move and they are charged particles, we can have electricity. Uh, finally, they have, tend to have very high melting and boiling points. So for example, sodium chloride, an ionic compound, has a uh, melting point of 801 degrees Celsius. Sugar, which is not ionic, 146. So big difference between ionic and molecular compounds. Okay, metals are a little bit weird, though. Um, so the properties of metals, so when we look at what metal, kind of metals' properties are, uh, 
uh, it suggests the metallic atoms are not packed closely together. Uh, and that's because we know metals can bend. And the only way for metals to be able to bend is for there to be room between the individual atoms so that the different atoms can reshape themselves and move around each other. Um, think about um, if there was no room to move. If there was no room to move, then nothing could move independent of the rest. Nothing could change the shape. But we know metals are malleable and ductile. They can change their shape. So this tells us that uh, there is room between the atoms. So what we get is this idea that you have these cations surrounded by this mobile sea of valence electrons. Now, why do I know they're cations? Well, it's still metals. We're still talking metals. Metals lose valence electrons. But in this case, because there's no um, non-metal to take them, the electrons just kind of float around, move from around atom to atom, atom to atom. So you get these uh, cations, which kind of provide the structure, and then these electrons just flowing around it. And I have some, some pictures of this or illustrations of this uh, coming up. Now these electrons are free uh, to drift from one part of the metal to another. They're not bound to any one atom or any one part of it. Um, and so the metallic bond, and again, this is going to be a little bit clear when I show you the illustration coming up, is this attraction between these freely floating valence electrons, because they're still valence electrons with a negative charge, and these positively charged ions. So again, it's this attraction between positive and negative. And yes, it is weird that the metals give up these electrons to meet the octet rule, and that's what causes them to be positively charged. And then, once they're positively charged, they're then attracted to the same electrons that they gave up. Uh, very weird, but definitely how it works. So here's kind of an illustration of what we see. If I took like a paper clip uh, and zoomed in super, super, super close, and this would not be to scale at all. So these metal ions would be the cations, and so the uh, metallic bond would be like this attraction here, attraction, attraction. Um, but also, let's say we get this attraction, and this attraction, and this attraction. Or let's say we get, let's pick a different color, here, to here, to here, to there. We're out of control here. So what we're seeing here is this network of attractions. No um, ion is attracted to another ion. Instead, what's holding this all together is this shared attractions between the ions and these electrons. So that's why they're not just going to completely just separate apart from themselves. The metal ions are trying to repel each other because they all have the same charge. But that attraction to those electrons is stronger than that repulsion that they feel for each other. So they stick around. And so they all kind of just follow along in this sea, um, just kind of floating about. But again, with lots of room between the ions. Now this is contrasted with ionic bonds. So here's an illustration of an ionic bond. So what we see here is this attraction chlorine to sodium and then chlorine to sodium, chlorine to sodium. So that's one set of attractions or we have like this. So we get these interwoven networks of attractions, but with very, very little room in between. This is why ionic bonds uh, or ionic compounds, you, they're not bendable. If you take a big salt block and you try to bend it, uh, it's just going to shatter. And it's going to actually shatter basically along these lines. But when you look at a metal, we can get that bending because there's now all this room between the ions. So how can we use uh, metallics, metallic bondings and what a metallic bond is to explain metals' properties? Well. Uh, we know metals are good conductors, conductors of electricity, and we already said that electricity is this movement of charged um, particles. Well, in a metal, what particles with charge can move? The electrons. The electrons can move freely from one part of the metal to another. So, uh, for example, with this is how we normally view electrical currents. We have a basic circuit set up. 
um, let's say in your house or your car and your phone, whatever, it's using metals as conductors. And it's actually the electrons moving in a uniform direction within uh, that metal. Uh, we know that metals are ductile and malleable. Basically, as a whole, means you can bend them without shattering them. Well, that's because each ion is surrounded by that sea of electrons. And when pushed or pulled or when tried to reshape, the cations can actually now move around each other. They can flow around each other. Um, the, the example I say here is think of like ball bearings in oil. Or another example would be if you've ever been to a wave pool. So you have lots of people, let's say, sitting in a wave pool. You can move from one part to another. Everyone's kind of just doing their own thing with the water. So we're continuing our look at different chemical bonds. Um, chapter 15, we're looking at ionic bonds. Chapter 16, we're going to look at covalent bonds. Um, besides all holding atoms together, very, very different ideas. So let's get into this. So first off, uh, a single covalent bond, which is the simplest type of covalent bond, is formed when a pair of electrons is shared between two atoms. I want to stress the word shared here. It's not a transfer of electrons anymore. It is a sharing of electrons. Now, other key words here is a pair of electrons. Electrons are always shared in pairs, and the electrons that are shared um, are these valence electrons that we've talked about already. So the idea here is, let's say we have two hydrogen atoms. Um, the octet rule is still alive and kicking here. So the hydrogen uh, atoms want to obey the octet rule. They want to be like helium, but each only has one valence electron. So what happens is one hydrogen atom becomes attracted to the electron of the other one. So this hydrogen atom on the left now views that it has two valence electrons. But at the same time, the hydrogen atom on the right is attracted to the other hydrogen uh, atom's electron, valence electron uh, so that it now views that it is uh, meeting the octet rule. So each hydrogen atom views that it is in control or in possession of those pairs of of the pair of electrons when in reality they are sharing it um, a few things I want to stress here there is actually no attraction between the two atoms that's a big difference from an ionic bond instead it's this attraction from the nucleus of one of the atoms to those shared electrons and the nucleus to the shared um, so yeah <clears throat> a little bit different uh, we can often represent this, uh, the pair of shared electrons as a dash. So instead of two dots, we could do a dash, so HH, uh, like we see right here. Uh, this is called a structural formula. It's a little bit different from a normal chemical formula in that a structural formula tells us not only what's present, so we see the two H's, but it also tells us how it's arranged. So this statement here, uh, I, don't, I actually go far more detail, really just nonmetals are going to form covalent bonds. Nonmetals with nonmetals form covalent bonds. You may I think that sounds familiar. Nonmetals with nonmetals make molecular compounds. Molecular compounds, here's get, letting the cat out of the bag, uh, are made of covalent bonds. And again, this is just another way for atoms to obey the octet rule. Uh, by sharing electrons, instead of transferring, by sharing electrons, they will have the electron configuration of the noble gas because each atom is viewing those shared electrons as belonging to itself. Okay, uh, looking at a couple examples here. So let's uh, just kind of look at the halogens. So we know the halogens are all diatomic. Here's why. So we have two fluorine atoms here, pretty straightforward. Um, and then what's going to happen is each fluorine atom is going to be attracted to that kind of lone electron in the other. And so that gives us those shared electrons, which I could draw just as the double dot. I don't need to put the circle around it. I'm just putting the circles around it to kind of illustrate this for you, or just the simple line. I think the line is simpler. You put your pencil down, you click, 
you let go, there you have a dot. Instead of or a line, instead of drawing a dot where you click, lift your uh, pencil, move it, push down, lift it again. It's far too many steps. Um, it's just much simpler to draw a line, though you could do the dots if you desire. Now with the previous fluorine molecule, notice that there were uh, six other electrons that were not being shared. It was six, there are six pairs of electrons around those fluorines that were not being shared. Those are called an unshared pairs of electrons. Mind-blowing in terms of definitions, I know. Called unshared pairs, also called lone pairs or non-bonding pairs. Um, I don't think there's anything tricky about that vocabulary in any way, shape, or form. Now, you may have remembered that the start, I said that this is what a single covalent bond is, which implies that there's possibly more like double or triple covalent bonds. In AP chemistry, we'll talk about why there's no such thing as a quadruple covalent bond, by the way. Um, so, uh, again, sometimes atoms will share more than one pair of electrons to fulfill the octet rule. A double covalent bond is when an, uh, atoms share two pairs of electrons, so a total of four electrons uh, together. A triple covalent bond would be three pairs of electrons. Now, we already know that we can represent a single covalent bond with a single line. We can represent a double covalent bond with two lines, or a triple covalent bond with, dum dum dum, three lines. I know, shocking. Um, now, one thing I want you to be aware of, and we'll deal with this next year in AP Chemistry, there are molecules that violate the octet rule. We are not going to deal with those this year. Next year we will. So here's just an example of nitrogen. Uh, so I have the Lewis structures for the nitrogen kind of drawn out, the Lewis dot diagrams. And notice I'm just kind of connecting the dots here with each other. So I get the connecting, connecting, connecting. Uh, and I'm doing that to form these pairs. So in the end, each nitrogen has a full octet. Each nitrogen has uh, these six shared electrons between them. So you can see those six shared electrons. And each nitrogen also has a lone pair of electrons. Now we're going to look at how we can deal with compounds. Dealing with compounds is just the same way that we are dealing with diatomics. So for instance with water, uh, simplest way to do this is what I call the connect the dot method. So you have your uh, electron dot diagram. We have these electrons are kind of by themselves and you just start connecting them up. If there's no stray electrons, you tend to have a good structure. So in this case, we'd have this oxygen uh, here in the center and connected to that by one single bond is a hydrogen, single bond hydrogen, and that oxygen still has two lone pairs of electrons attached to it. Ammonia ends up looking much very the same. So again, connect, connect, connect. So we get nitrogen in the center. Nitrogen still has its lone pair. Wow, that was a terrible dot. Oh my, it's getting worse as I do this. So there we go. I'm going to stop. Uh, hydrogen, single bond to hydrogen single bond to hydrogen and again each of these single bonds contains two electrons so this nitrogen is viewing it controls all of this here so one two three four five six seven eight so the nitrogen is obeying the octet rule methane um yeah just real real fast ba Sound effects, ooh, carbon in the center. Drawn the hydrogens, hydrogens being drawn. So how many lone pairs are on that carbon? Zero, I hear you say, from the future. And you'd be correct. Okay, let's look at carbon dioxide, a little bit trickier. So the first thing we wanna have is our um, kind of electron dot diagram. So I'm gonna have carbon, so I know carbon dioxide is CO2. Uh, the thing that there's only one of is usually first, and well, there's only one of it, so that's kind of our center thing there. So one carbon uh, with four valence electrons. And again, the thing if it's first is usually our center. So oxygen's now one, two, 
three, four, five, six. Oxygen, one, two, three, four, five, six. And again, we can play connect the dots. So do do dots dots. I'm playing connect the dots. So when we redraw this, carbon is still in our center. How many bonds does it have to the oxygen on the left? Well, two. And then the oxygen has two lone pairs. On the right, two bonds to the oxygen on the right. And that oxygen has two lone pairs. So there would be the structure of carbon dioxide. Now when you start getting into polyatomics, things get a little trickier. The, the connect the dot method starts to not work. Uh, because what polyatomic ions are, besides being those things you hated memorizing earlier in the year, is that they are actually covalently bonded compounds that happen to have more or less electrons than they should. If they have more electrons than they should, they have a negative charge. The negative charge that they have tells you how many more they should. If they have a positive charge like ammonium, it tells you how many electrons fewer than it has. And when dealing with uh, structures, it becomes a little bit trickier. So let's look at sulfide here, for instance. I'm going to show you another way we can do this. So we know the formula here. So what I would recommend doing with this other method is we start off by adding up all the valence electrons that are present. This tells me how many electrons I have to work with. So we see sulfur. Sulfur has six valence electrons. Oxygen uh, has six, there's three of them, so three times six. Finally, that two negative. That two negative tells us we have two more electrons than we should, so plus two. So adding this all together, we get uh, 18, 24, 26 valence electrons to work with. That's our grand total. Next thing we do is we do a basic skeleton structure of your molecule. So sulfur there is in the center, and everything else is going to be connected to that. And when I connect everything, I connect everything with single bonds. Now, what's important, each single bond that I just created contains two electrons. So I look back to my total. There's three bonds there. That's six electrons total. So we now have 20 electrons to work with. So again, I added up all my electrons first, then I drew my basic structure connecting everything with single bonds, and then I'm doing a running tally of how many electrons I have left. Uh, next step, start filling up the octet of all your outer atoms. So I'll count as I go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So I used up 18 electrons, leaving me with two. Now, uh, what I did is, again, I made sure that all the outer atoms had a full octet. They now do. So here's where you get some variable steps depending on what you have left. If you have electrons left over, like I do, dump them on your central atom. So I have two electrons two electrons on your central atom, we're good to go. Now, that's not always going to be what happens. Um, let's say that we didn't do that, so I can't really erase easily, so we didn't do that. Let's say we had no electrons left over and we we're at this point. What you can then do is take a pair of electrons from an outer atom and turn it into a bond. That way we can fulfill the octet rule uh, if needed. But again, in this case, we didn't have to. Now, resonance. Resonance is an odd thing. We actually saw resonance in kind of my last example there. So let's look at ozone. So uh, ozone is O3. So again, we're going to walk through this the same way we did the last one. So each oxygen has six valence electrons. There's three of them, so times three, that's a times, not a plus, I'm sorry. So we have 18 electrons to work with. I set up my basic structure, oxygen, oxygen, 
oxygen. Don't make rings or squares or triangles. Don't make weird shapes until you get a lot more experience with this. Nice lines are the way to go. So we have everything connected to a central oxygen. So how many electrons did I just use? Two bonds. That's four. That's right. So I have 14 left. Uh, so I start putting around the central atom. Well, or sorry, outer atoms. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. I have two electrons left over. Where do those go? They go on the central atom. So here's where life gets interesting. I could take a pair of electrons from this atom on the left and I could make a bond right there. Or I could take a pair of atom electrons from the atom on the right and make a bond right there. I have a choice. Because I have a choice, that creates what we call resonance. So I could end up with either of these two structures. Or no double bond there. My apologies. Who do 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 can't erase on this because it's a dumb program. There we go. You may be thinking to yourself, self, the only difference between those two structures is which side the double bond is. Surely that can't be a big difference, but it is. That's what, when we get resonance. So first off, let's focus on how you know that there's resonance. Resonance occurs when you have a choice as to where to put a double bond. That's really all that it is. So again, this just says the two structures are different, but without changing the position of the oxygens, all we're changing is where that double bond is. Um, now, earlier chemists imagined that these electron, those um, the electrons would actually flip back and forth or resonate between the two atoms, which is where it got its name. So it would view there was like one uh, double bond on the left first, then the double bond on the right, double bond on the left, double bond on the right. Um, and we put a double-headed arrow between the two to kind of indicate that. Well, what's the problem with this? Well... We know now that double bonds are shorter than single bonds. Just a fact, except that double bonds are shorter than single bonds. But when we do experiments, it shows that the two bonds in ozone are actually the same length. Now, what's the issue here? They're not switching back and forth, because if they were switching back and forth, we would see one side be longer than shorter, one side be longer than shorter. So shorter, longer, shorter, longer, shorter, longer, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That's not what we see. We actually see a consistent same length between the two. And what's interesting is that length is somewhere between a single and a double bond. So we can actually say that the actual bonding of that ozone or actual bonding of something with resonance is an average of the two. So yeah, we're not bouncing back and forth. The actual bonding is an average or a mixture or a hybrid of the two. So with the ozone, we could actually say instead of there being a single bond and a double bond, you kind of have two one and a half bonds. You have two of something that's a little bit more than a single bond, but a bit less than a double bond. And so we use resonance to help just visualize the bonding in certain molecules. Okay, time for polar bonds. Last section of this unit. Woohoo, we're almost there. So, covalent bonds are all about the sharing of electrons, but I want you to think back. Think about if you have a sibling, this makes sense. If you don't have a sibling, think about friends that I assume that you might have that have siblings. You might know that when there is sharing, there is sometimes equal sharing. Sometimes there is unequal sharing. And that's the same thing with sharing these, co uh, these electrons in covalent bonds. Because again, each atom is pulling on those electrons. Like in a game of tug of war, um, so each nuclei wants those electrons for themselves, but they're each pulling on it, so that's what's causing the sharing. Now, when each nucleus pulls the same on the shared electrons, then the electrons are shared equally. 
and we call that a nonpolar covalent bond. Think of this like a game of tug of war with two equally strong teams. Here's kind of a picture of this. So uh, see, with polarity, we have polar bears. That's extremely clever. You should be entertained by that. Uh, anyway, so you have the polar bears with their ice cream and you have the penguins with their ice cream. Um, the polar bears, even though the polar bears are very strong, you have two equally strong polar bears so that ice cream is shared equally. Penguins are very weak. Uh, each penguin wants that ice cream, but uh, because they're equally weak, it's still shared equally. But when you get different poles, oftentimes with different atoms, you're going to diff get different amounts of pole, then you get what's called a polar covalent bond, or simply just a polar bond. And what happens there, this goes back to two chapters ago when we talked about electronegativity. Remember, electronegativity is this strength of attraction that a nucleus will have or an atom will have two electrons in a bond. So the atom with the stronger electronegativity will have a stronger attraction to those electrons, meaning it's going to pull those electrons closer to itself. So you get this unequal sharing. So here's kind of a official picture of this you'd see in a, like chemistry textbooks. So you have HF, fluorine is the most electronegative atom, hydrogen pretty um, uh, weak electronegativity. So what has happened is the fluorine has pulled those electrons towards itself, creating this electron-rich region. Now, I want to point out, it has not completely pulled the electrons from the hydrogen. That's what we would actually call an ionic bond. No, 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 it's still sharing, it's just unequal sharing. So the uh, fluorine end of this molecule would have more of the electrons, more of the time, creating kind of this electron-rich region, uh, giving it a slight uh, negative charge. Whereas the hydrogen, because the electrons are pulled a little bit farther from that, uh, don't have the electrons as much, giving it a very slight positive charge. And we see this with the ice cream. So we now have the polar bear and the penguin. Bears are stronger than penguins. So the polar bear is pulling the ice cream more towards itself. The penguin still has got a uh, hand on it, but it's not equal sharing anymore. So a couple examples of this. So between hydrogen and chlorine, uh, if I look up electronegativity values, I see that chlorine is more electronegative. And there's two ways we can illustrate this. You can either illustrate polarity with this type of diagram where you put a little plus sign on the positive end and the plus turns into an arrow pointing in the direction of the more electronegative thing. Uh, in the waters, oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen, so you get the same sort of deal uh, on either side. But there's another way we can show polarity. So again, uh, the more electronegative thing is going to pull the electrons closer to it, creating a slight negative charge. So you can use this lowercase delta sign with a negative, lowercase delta sign with a positive, and that's just there to indicate very slight charge. Much, much less uh, charge than you would see with, an ion, with individual ions like cations or anions. It is a slight amount of charge. Uh, so, how do we know what we're dealing with? Well, all you have to do is look at the electronegativity values uh, in your textbook and subtract them. It's the electronegativity difference. If <coughs> it's a difference between 0 to about 0.4, we say that's close enough. Nonpolar bond. About 0.4 to 2, polar covalent. More than 2, it's actually ionic. And we can see with this ionic bond, this would be like the polar bear running away with the ice cream, leaving the penguin with none. So polar molecules. And this is where it gets a little bit odd. You just have to bear with me um, and just get the basics of this. So the presence of a polar bond in a molecule can make the entire molecule polar. So what is a polar molecule? A polar molecule is a molecule that has a slightly positive end and a slightly negative end. Um, we can also call those dipolar molecules or a dipole molecule, di meaning two. 
Uh, water was a great example of this. So we saw with water, if I look at the structure of it, we have the oxygen, hydrogen, hydrogen. We get some lone pairs there. And uh, electrons are being pulled up towards the oxygen, up towards the oxygen, giving the oxygen up here a slightly negative charge, and this end a slightly positive charge. So that would be a polar molecule or a dipole molecule. But, and this is just, you just need to know this, you don't need to be able to predict this. Just because there's a polar bond does not mean the molecule will be polar. Now, one thing I want to stress, to have a polar molecule, you require a polar bond. But the polar uh, bond does not always mean you have a polar molecule. Great example, this is carbon dioxide. When we look at carbon dioxide, what we see is carbon here in the center, double bond oxygen, lone pairs, double bond oxygen, lone pairs. Oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, so electrons pulled to the right, electrons pulled to the left, but because the electrons are being pulled equally to the left and the right, um, these cancel out, so nothing goes anywhere. So even though each bond is polar, they're pulling in opposite directions, meaning the molecule itself is not. A few little things I want to, I want to bring up, just kind of a grab bag of ideas. Uh, bond disassociation energy, very simply, uh, the bond disassociation energy is the amount of energy you need to break a given bond. The greater the bond disassociation energy is, the more energy you need to break it. So the stronger the bond is, the greater the bond disassociation energy. And this varies from bond to bond, and we'll get much more into this next year in AP Chemistry. Uh, finally, intermolecular attractions. Again, we'll spend an entire chapter on this in AP Chemistry. just want to touch the surface of this now. Um, these attractions between molecules, not within a molecule. Within a molecule would be intramolecular attractions. That's your ionic bonding and your covalent bonding. Intermolecular attractions is attractive forces between different molecules. It's also called the van der Waals forces. You might have learned uh, that name in biology. Uh, there's two primary types. There's dispersion forces, which are very, very weak, but every molecule has them. So everybody ha every molecule will experience dispersion forces, but they're the weakest. And it's thought to be caused by the motion of electrons. And again, we'll get into this much deeper in AP chemistry. You then have dipole interactions. Uh, these are stronger, but they're an attractive force between polar molecules. Because what's a polar molecule? It's a molecule with a positive and a negative end. So it's actually the attraction between the positive and negative end of different molecules. Now there's a special type of dipole interaction. So some people say there's three types of intermolecular attractions. Uh, called hydrogen bonding. And if the dipole involves hydrogen, then it's hydrogen bonding, and that is the strongest but also the rarest type of intermolecular force.